Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming in and I hope you had a good day so far at Berlin Buzzwords. This is my second talk today in less than 41 hour. Uh, so I am, so, yeah, why is this not working? So I am Sunil Marthi and I work at Red Hat and I am based out of Washington DC in Virginia and I'm a member of Apache Foundation, and I'm a committer on Apache Mahout, OpenNLP, and Apache Streams. And I also mentor a few projects in the Apache Incubator. My name is uh, Tomaso Teofili. I work uh, at Adobe Systems as a software engineer. I'm um, uh, also a member of the Apache Software Foundation and contributing to a bunch of uh, projects there. So like um, Lucene, uh, Joshua, OpenNLP, uh, JackRabbit, and a few others. Uh, Okay, that's it. So, uh, when I say what is multilingual search, so we are going to be talking about multilingual search. What is multilingual search? And why do we need multilingual search? And what is statistical machine translation? Have folks heard about that before, statistical machine translation? Okay, and overview of Apache Joshua and a Dataflow pipeline for the demo we have coming up, and we have a demo. So, the first question is what is multilingual search? So how often, how many of you are non-English uh, non speakers here? I am one, of course. Yeah, pretty much all of most of us here. So has it ever annoyed you that most of the content we have on the web is always is all in English, and uh, you would rather prefer something in native languages? Or rather, you see the search results in your native languages? So, <coughs> so most of the content we have is in different languages, and all of us speak different languages, users speak different languages. So when you want to do a search, uh, you would rather search on text that is in English as well as in the different languages, and you also want to be able to do a query in your native language, right? And uh, most of the time when you do this, you have, a, you have a parallel corpora, that is you have the text in English and the text in German, and you line them up to see the what the translation looks like. Sometimes you've got to translate the user queries itself, and sometimes you've got to translate the documents itself so that you can retrieve your results. So given that, that's one of the reasons why you would need multilingual search. So if you look at the online content we have today, the Wikipedia dumps, the English content is 62 gigs, the German content is 17 gigs, and Italian content is 10 gigs, right? You can see the big gap here. It's mostly English. The content is English. And as most of the audience here is non-English speakers. And uh, most of the search queries we do are pretty much in English, like I search for a scalar product or a vector product or whatever. And uh, I would rather prefer that the search results are retrieved. When I get back the search results, it's translated back into the native language, the language I would prefer. Or even consolidate all of the different results from the different corpor corpora, like in English and uh, German or Italian, all con consolidate all the results into one common language. So that's what we are talking about by embracing diversity, when we are talking about embracing diversity here. So for example here, Tommaso is Italian's, Italian, obviously. So when he's doing a search for a scalar product, the results he's getting back from Google is, it's all in Italian. The first search result is an Italian search result. So that's the kind of, uh, that's what you would prefer when you're doing a search. And uh, last year, the US Department of, uh, it's actually the National Intelligence Department, they had a contest, it's still running, called Material. So you want to be able to make a query in English, search over the content in all the different languages. Let's say if I want to do a query about uh, terrorism, and I want to search all the different languages and across the web, consolidate all the, translate all the content into English, summarize the content in English, and get the results back in English. And this is something the national intelligence of the US government wants to do that. It's a contest they have now, it's still active. So this is one of the reasons why you need multilingual search. So what is uh, machine translation? <coughs> So machine translation, uh, do folks have any idea what machine translation is, or uh, anyone who's actually into this search and information retrieval? OK. So basically, you have statistical models that are trained. So you have, let's say, if I'm trying to do a, uh, create a model that is translating from English to German or German to English, I create a language pack for that. Uh, how do I do that? I have all the content. I line up all the sentences, the sentence A from here and the sentence A from the same document, translated document. I line up all the sentences. And I try to create mappings, either phrase-based mappings. I can take a phrase and you know, map, this, map this single word from here to multi -words, multiple words here, or a phrase from here to the phrase here. And it's kind of, it happens based on a probability distribution, if you're familiar with Bayes, Bayesian uh, theorem. Uh, 
So probability of E is a string in the target language, which is English, for example. And the uh, source language is uh, French, Spanish. And E of F. And uh, you are trying to calculate the probability E of F. And uh, you can have several probabilities, but the probability that you choose is the max probability. Okay, E of F is arg max. This is the base rule. If you're familiar with the Bayes theorem. And uh, this is the best translation. The one with the highest probability is what you pick from the several probabilities that you get. And uh, we'll look at that, how it works. So there are different ways of doing uh, machine translation. One of them is word-based translation. And uh, here, basically, how do you translate a word? I, I can look up in a dictionary. For example, uh, let me try my German here. Jibbaude. <laughs> Did I get that right? J OK, Jibbaude. It's It could be either a building, or a house, or a tower. And uh, yeah, you can have multiple translations of that in English. So some of them are more frequent. So for example, tower is not that frequently used. So building and house are more uh, frequently used. So you got to fi figure out which one do I pick as a correct translation for a word. So another example is, if I look at the translation of Jibaude, and uh, if I'm looking, at, if I do a Google search, for the house, I get 5.28 billion hits on Google. And for building, I get 4.16. And for tower, I get 9.28 billion. So uh, that should be million. Yeah, sorry, that's million. And uh, for each of them, you calculate the probability. So obviously, the house has the highest probability of 0.51. And uh, the tower has the lowest least probability of 0.09. So the correct translation for uh, Giborde, uh, Giborde would be house. Sorry, pardon me. So how do you do this now? So what you have to do is you've got to align your text. You can take a text from English, and you can take a text from German. And uh, we align all the words in the language. For example, das Giborde ist hoch. OK, was it good? Yeah. So the building is high. That's a translation. So I, transla I map the words das Das, D, and uh, this is to building, is, is, hawk, high. And I get the word positions. So the word positions are one, two, three, four. So when you do that, so when you do this alignment, you've got to calculate and we come up with an alignment function. And uh, an alignment function, example of an alignment function is you map each English word to the corresponding position to the German word. So we map each I, English word I at position I to the German word position J. For example, in the previous one, it was one to one mapping one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four. So it could so happen that you could have one too many translations. So das ist ein Hochhaus. Okay. <laughs> the, so it translates to this is a high rise building. So this one word maps to three different English words. So that's an alignment, that's, that's your alignment function. High rise building. OK, so these are some of the things that you need to fa factor in when you're building your machine uh, translation language models. And uh, so this is word based translation. And uh, word based translation is not used all that much now. And uh, what's used now is phrase based translation. You trans map your phrases. So uh, in word based models, you have the words as your atomic unit. Whereas in phrase based models, you translate phrases and you treat your phrases as atomic units. So the advantages of going with a phrase-based model is uh, <coughs> you have many-to-many -many translation that can handle non-compositional phrases, uh, phrases, like in the previous one, we had a uh, hawk horse mapping to high-rise building. It, this is a non-compositional phrase, right? So you can, with phrase-based translation, you can actually map that better. And uh, the more data you have and the longer phrases, you can learn longer phrases and better. You can learn better phrases. And this is kind of the standard model that Google uses for Google Translate engine. So for example, in a phrase-based model, I have a sentence in German. Berlin ist ein herausragendes Kunst und Kulturzentrum. OK? Was it good? Yeah. So which translates to Berlin is an outstanding art and, uh, outstanding art and cultural center. So this phrase maps to a phrase here, right? And uh, so basically, you segment your input into phrases, and uh, you translate each of the phrases into English. And you need to reorder your phrases when you translate them back into German or English. You need to reorder the phrases to get the correct syntax. 
So when you do this, when you build your language models, the next step is when you're actually coming to do a translation, machine translation, you've got to decode your uh, inputs with them based on the models. So for decoding that, we have a mathematical model for translation. So for example, based on the probabilities, uh, find the translation, the best translation with the highest probability. So based on the probabilities that you have for each of the phrases, you calculate the phrase probabilities for each of the phrases and pick the phrase with the highest probability. And uh, when you do this, there are two types of errors that could occur. The most probable translation is already bad, so we've got to fix our models, or you don't find the most probable translation at all, so you've got to fix your search when you do the search. So for example, when your translation, the way the translation process works is, so let's say I have this German sentence, er trinket ja nok nichts. Okay, when I translate this, it's er translates to he, and then that's a phrase here. This ja nok nix is a phrase. So that translates to does not yet. Or it's quite, quite close to that. And uh, trinke is drink. So, th so that's, uh, that's how you translate uh, that based on the phrases. Er trinke ja nok nix, he does not yet drink. Right? So you, here you are reordering the words. So the drink, instead of showing up here, it shows up here. You are re reordering the words. OK, with that, uh, do you have any questions so far on this? OK, I'll turn it over to Tomaso, who is going to be talking about Apache Joshua and doing a demo of how this works. OK, thanks, Sunil. Um, so uh, Apache Joshua is a, a statistical machine translation uh, project uh, that was um, originally developed by uh, Johns Hopkins University and uh, UPenn. Um, and got into the incubator um, something like one or a year and a half ago, or something like that. Um, and actually, today we're probably going our first incubating release. Um, so um, it took it took us uh, quite a while to to get along with all the process uh, uh, at the Apache Software Foundation and fix some um, licensing and uh, and other stuff. Uh, but um, we're um, we're being, uh, the, the project is being um, used by uh, already at Amazon and uh, Jet Propulsion uh, Laboratory at NASA uh, and um, also integrated, I mean, and um, there are open issues to integrate uh, with other projects at the Apache Software Foundation like Apache Solar uh, or Tika uh, that has a translation API um, and even uh, in the Jackrabbit Oak content repository. Um, so, uh, um, a very cool thing about Joshua is that it comes out basically as a tool that you can already use out of the box. Uh, so, um, the, the release we are going to have uh, um, out in a few hours is basically a source release so that you can use it to uh, build and train your own statistical machine translation uh, model. Uh, but also we provide a few uh, binary distributions of language packs, uh, something like 64 um, language, pack, uh, language packs uh, for uh, different language pairs, uh, which you can basically unpack and use from the command line. Uh, and that's uh, actually one of the um, things we're working on also on the Joshua side, uh, that um, a lot of, uh, basically it was built um, uh, as a tool um, that you can use, uh, for, for example, within your uh, bash uh, scripts, but also you can start up a server and you can uh, do HTTP requests and you get HTTP responses. So something like a separate component in your um, environment and uh, scenario, depending on what you need. Um, but what, what we're also working on is to integrate it as, um, um, as a library that you can use uh, from uh, basically programmatically. Um, and that's um, requiring something, some work that um, we're going to do there um, to remove uh, some things that uh, scripts uh, or at least to make it possible to use different things. Uh, so for example, we have an open issue to use uh, uh, NLP uh, library uh, open NLP to do the pre-processing of the text uh, while building uh, the machine translation model instead of um, scripts that we have it in the in the release in the source release. 
Um, so uh, here are, uh, I hope they read uh, well enough, uh, a couple of uh, possible flows. Uh, so uh, because here we are talking about uh, Joshua in the context of, or basically machine translation in the context of search. Um, and um, uh, here are basically two slightly different scenarios. So in the left, left one, uh, you have that um, the user query string comes together with a user profile. And if you think about um, the use case one uh, that we, we showed basically the picture from the Google search. Let me go back uh, a bit here. That's basically what happens. I mean, uh, I'm not saying in any way uh, that I'm Italian. I mean, I just uh, typed Scalar product. Uh, so, I mean, uh, Google is not doing that via um, the, um, 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 the website, basically. It's not because I'm using google.it or google.de. Uh, so uh, perhaps it's just because I'm logged in uh, via with, with, with my Google account. So it uses my profile data uh, to, to decide whether or not provided uh, machine translated, um, we use a machine translated query uh, and uh, which which uh, language uh, translate to? Um, so here, what we have. So imagine that we have, um, like in the in the demo uh, that we will see afterwards, we have two decoders, basically two uh, models, uh, machine translation models that can do translation, for example, from English to Italian or for English. Uh, to German, so the user profile is used to to pick up the right decoder, and um, in in that case, what we have is that the query, uh, the user entered query gets uh, enhanced, uh, and uh, you have that uh, the translated query is added as uh, using a Lucene uh, kind of slang as a Boolean query. So you have the original query written in the in the in English, for example, scalar product. But you also also have the um, translated query written in the translated uh, language, which is prodotto scalare, and therefore um, you get that the searcher uh, gets queried with um, with a query which uh, uh, basically in two versions, um, and that's that's one thing. Uh, on the other end, we could have uh, another use case which is slightly different. So. Uh, instead of using the user profile, what we use is that uh, we detect the language in which the user query string was written um, and then um, do a search uh, using um, also uh, other um, decoders that we have. So if it's written in English, we can provide also a, a query uh, in uh, Italian or in uh, um, uh, German. So. Um, in the first case, what we are looking for is to improve the, uh, the precision of our search engine. So basically, uh, for me as a, as a user uh, on the search engine, uh, in, the, in the case, for example, of tech-related um, uh, content and topics, is probably easier and preferable to read content that's written in my native language. Um, so I get uh, um, the, the, native, uh, the, the, the result written in the native language first. Right, so I get the best results first, so I get an improved precision. Um, on the other end, on the on in the second uh, in the second um, use case, what what uh, what it's doing is that uh, I'm basically providing more results uh, in the hope that uh, among those results, th those are uh, relevant enough to the end user. So what we have is that we avoid missing u uh, results that could be useful to the end user. Uh, by uh, doing machine translation. Um, and there is an, an interesting ex extension of this, uh, of this use case. Uh, so for example, um, machine translation can also do um, paraphrase translation. So if you have um, a, corpora, a parallel corpora having basically two different versions of the same sentence, both in English, uh, what you can do here, in, instead of um, translating the query from English to Italian or from English to German, you do uh, an English to English translation. And so um, you basically um, 
look to improving again the recall the the probability that the search the user entered uh, query matches uh, results on your uh, on your search engine um, <coughs> and this is basically just for um, uh, translating uh, the user query um, another thing that um, we uh, we discussed um, in the use case too uh, is uh, native only so uh, how is it useful or is it useful to have um, results translated into your native um, language so this thing here is a feature uh, in Google search that was disabled is translated for in pages something like three or four years ago um, because uh, um, it was basically not used very much by the end users and that's uh, fine for the uh, web search uh, probably but uh, on the other end we, had, we have other um, use cases like mentioned by Sunil uh, where this can be useful or uh, and one thing that I uh, would like you to think is um, to uh, uh, as the title of the talk to embrace diversity so um, when we um, do things when we uh, decide how to set up our search engine and how to uh, whether doing machine translation or not uh, or on query or um, uh, document side uh, what are we uh, what do we want to do for our for our end users so um, we do not want uh, to skip that just because I don't know Google or whatever other provided uh, decided to discard it so uh, think of, um, for example, a use case of uh, um, uh, refugees uh, and I mean or immigrants. We have lots of uh, um, such stories. Where, uh, basically, news is full of, of such stories. Um, so, if I, is, uh, as a refugee, the, and since search is um, a tool that is uh, the entry point of uh, kind of every application, uh, web application system or I mean it's, it's an important one um, if users uh, would be allowed to um, search in their native language uh, the query being translated into English getting English results and then back translated into their, na their native language so think if you come from as a refugee really it's it's something that uh, and we have su such systems uh, we have uh, we have been talking uh, on the Joshua mailing list with someone building such systems where basically uh, doing machine translation is ju not just a cool thing for precision and recall metrics for information from the information retrieval uh, word, but are just things that help users and people um, at the end of their day. Um, so, um, yeah, that's uh, I think an, an important point to, to, to make when thinking about this this feature um, so and um, before going uh, in a in a quick demo uh, um, I think um, yeah th there are uh, a few references here um, and uh, credits to people that helped uh, um, Taking up this this talk. Yeah, I mean, these are the folks that helped us put together this talk. Jern is here, right here. Yeah, hands up. Matt Post is the PMC chair of Apache Joshua, and is is based in John Hopkins University, Baltimore. And uh, Bruno is in uh, New Zealand. He hel helped us with the slide deck. Yeah, yeah. So let's get uh, into a quick demo. Okay, so uh, I have um, um, downloaded uh, Wikipedia dumps from uh, uh, for English, ger English, uh, German, and Italian, and um, uh, indexed them into Lucene, uh, and then downloaded uh, Joshua decoders. In, the, in this case, we are using the decoder uh, that translate from English to German. Um, so. Um, setting up the decoder we're, we're setting up the decoder and then we we are using the open nlp uh still unreleased uh, language detection um uh tool uh to do the language detection component that we we've seen in the um in the diagram so
So, and I mean, this is, I hope it reads clear enough. No. Uh, can you, in the background, read well enough? OK. OK. So uh, what do you basically the, the, uh, the, the, the important piece here is that we have that the Lucene query, but we have uh, uh, sketched up um, uh, an, improve, an improved query parser, which uh, does the, the flow that we, uh, we have seen. Basically, um, detecting the language in which the, the query was written and uh, picking up the right uh, machine translation model and doing the machine translation and adding um, uh, the machine translated query as a um, Boolean query for Lucene. Um, so here we are um, um, writing in uh, German. So uh, I don't know, Berlin restaurants. Uh, sorry, in, in English. And we want, uh, yeah, mixed up. Um, so here um, we, we didn't get uh, um, anything different because basically restaurant is one of those words which doesn't have uh, a lot of um, I mean it's a kind of um, word that exists in uh, in in different languages uh, still we'll see that we we have um, results coming from both uh, English and, and German content uh, so Uh, while here, uh, what, what we have is that the, the, um, the TetQuick uh, language was uh, typo uh, for uh, um, uh, I am in Berlin um, uh, is, is English, and so I uh, it gets translated into Ich bin in Berlin, uh, something like that, and so the the Lucene query gets uh, expanded. So from text I am Berlin, uh, text Ich bin Berlin. Uh, and so here we get both uh, the results from uh, German and English, but uh, uh, we put the, the German one upwards uh, because it's basically the uh, more relevant. So uh, exactly the same as in the, in the case of Scalar product. Um, yeah, so that's, um, and we can, do, we can do a lot of uh, such um, example queries and see uh, how the, the um, uh, the, the, the search engine can uh, handle, uh, handle this and the, the query gets translate, uh, translated. Um, yeah. So here, um, the, um, this. Repeat the question. Hey, can you repeat the question? The question is, how does the translation work if there's a typo in the user query, right? Okay, so um, the way um, you can do it, you can do it either in both in uh, two different ways, at least. Uh, so one way is to um, uh, design dedicated spell checkers um, for for dedicated language, but on the other hand, what you can also do is um, so when building the uh, statistical machine translation model. Uh, you can provide uh, um, language model uh, with some parameters. So something like you build an n-gram language models when you can, uh, and in the n-gram basically, uh, of, uh, so like a tree-gram, uh, you split the sentence in uh, chunks of three characters each. So in, in when, when you use uh, such um, language models when building the, um, the language pack, uh, the, the language uh, model uh, becomes, uh, sorry, the, um, the statistical machine translation model becomes uh, kind of uh, uh, less impacted by those typos because it doesn't re uh, rely on um, uh, just words, but on portions of words and probabilities of words uh, of chunks, uh, of such chunks to, uh, uh, to stick together in the same sentence, in the same sequence. Uh, so that's uh, the way you can, you can handle this. Yeah, welcome. Um, so this, um, so do you have enough time? Yeah, 10 minutes. Yeah, okay. Um, so in this, um, this case is uh, slightly different. So we have that, uh, we write, uh, we do the other thing. So we write in our native language and we will get the results in, uh, in English language. 
Um, and again, this I think is, uh, you can think of um, useful scenarios for this as well. So um, uh, again, think about um, um, uh, refugees or uh, people that looks for asylum uh, in a certain country and needs some paperwork to be done. And uh, so he needs to get the results uh, um, uh, some some forms to fill in and, and print, and they need uh, the one in uh, in English, for example, if they want to to, to go to to England. So, yeah, as soon as it loads, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Does this already support the phrase-based model? And yes. also, if you can, in specific language domains, if you can insert some, some language phrases which are not, like fashion language, for example, or something. Uh, like well, um, you can you repeat this? So can, you teach, can you teach the model to learn more words? So, so is it... So if it's an online uh, kind of online, not online learning... Let's say I have my own dictionary of, of a language that yes. is not yeah, just yeah. general language. So can I ingest this yeah. type of language inside? Mm -hmm. And if you support like, the phrase-based model outside of the box for all languages... So most easy. of these language packs are phrase-based models. Actually, it's uh, phrase-based and I think syntax-based. So it's kind of a mix. So definitely you can do that. And the more content you have, the better, mo better your phrases are. And so, and we, we also have discussed on the mailing list uh, the possibility of introducing something like, uh, so you build uh, uh, your um, model from your data at first, and then at some point you realize you have to, I don't know, adjust it or feed in something else. So we talked about um, also including some uh, sort of uh, rules or things that you can add afterwards to the model so that it's not like online learning, but it, I mean, you can still do something on an existing model without having to retrain uh, the whole thing. Um, I just want to follow up on that. So let's say I have one keyword in, in the German language. Do I supply all the possible translations for our languages and then would be used directly in the phrase-based model, if this is how it would work? Um, so you get a list of candidates with scores. And so basically there you can either decide to what to do with that. From the from the model um, from the output basically of the Joshua decoder. Yeah, but I want to teach. I want to teach. Ah, you mean from? Uh, yes. So I have my own language yeah. domain, and I want to teach Apache sure, yes. Joshua to learn. You can create your own from. models for the different languages, and uh, you can create the translation from uh, your language to which your language the target language is. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Sorry. So. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know, it's something like an Italian um, pizza. So this is something like I need documents to, to get into Berlin, something like that, or pa paperwork or something like that. So, and, and here we have the English translation. So, um, I forgot to say that uh, this one translates from Italian to English. So here, um, the uh, Documenti per entrare a Berlino gets translated into documents to enter Berlin. Uh, and again, the, the Lucene query gets uh, enhanced. And uh, here I get um, Italian documents. Um, but yeah, that's basically just because we have this um, uh, those uh, setting of putting uh, Italian document first, but we will also have uh, basic native uh, documents first, but we will also have the, the English one uh, coming. Um, so I'm sure um, uh, someone uh, may ask about uh, neural machine translation, so uh, I want to <laughs> uh, to get it this, this question uh, in advance. So we have the, um, discussed about, um, about this in the, in the Joshua mailing list. So at the moment, Joshua is, um, is not uh, neural, neural um, network based. It's just based on uh, statistical, the statistical models. Statistical models like uh, Sunil uh, <coughs> explained yeah. beforehand. Um, but um, uh, I mean, I, I've read a bit, uh, some, some papers about that. Uh, we, we've read some papers about that. Um, and while I think that there are very interesting things about, uh, about those uh, models, like for example, um, 
some, a paper claimed to be able to extract something like a meta uh, language that can be used uh, in all kinds of translations. Um, uh, I don't remember if, if it was DeepMind related, but basically uh, the, the key thing is, um, I mean, I would suggest uh, that um, we think to um, this not, uh, uh, not, not just to the tools, let's say. So here we've presented uh, the demo built upon Lucene, OpenNLP, and Joshua, uh, but it could be also something different. I mean, and uh, I don't think it's all just a matter of what's better, but what best suits uh, your needs and uh, and stuff like that. So rather than so focus on the users rather than the tools. Uh, yeah. Uh, hello, so I have a question regarding overlapping vocabulary of the languages. So during the language detection engine, uh, if let's say German and uh, English, there are some words overlapping, mm -hmm. then how do you detect that it's a German or it's English or if the words do have Do you mean in the language detection or in, uh, in building the, the machine translation model? In language detection, maybe. Okay. Uh, when you say overlapping, are you talking about the same word in two languages? Yeah. So mm -hmm. for example, wo is okay. like uh, yeah. it sounds okay. like who in English, but it's right. like where so in German. So the the one way to disambiguate that is to go with larger uh, characterograms, go with more data and more character engrams, right? Yeah. So that way you can disambiguate English and German when you have similar words showing up in both. So you can go with the phrases, right? I mean, so it's just it's don't go by the word, go by the phrase that it's part of. Yeah, it's the context that yeah. uh, it's the context. Mix up. Yeah. So you cannot say if uh, Berlin it's a German or English word just by Berlin. Even you, you as a human. This is for language detection, right? Not yeah. for. So it's yeah. yeah. Yorn could say better. <laughs> so. Any questions? Yeah. So going back to uh, machine translation in the. So, so back to the context of machine translation in search, uh, I think that the biggest obstacle to uh, being able to support the features that you described earlier uh, is, oh, as always, getting parallel corp mm -hmm. corpora. Uh, are there maybe ways or techniques in which um, one might be able to construct more easily a parallel corpus for uh, for the search queries in particular, uh, if uh, if the task at hand is to uh, first translate the query uh, before to search in other languages, mm -hmm. maybe. Well, I, I think it's uh, uh, as usual. Uh, I mean, yeah, you're right. It's uh, it's an issue, and especially um, I mean. Uh, Short text is a um, uh, challenge for um, a lot of NLP related techniques or statistical based te techniques. I mean, like uh, doing sentiment analysis on Twitter is not uh, um, difficult, um, as difficult as it is for large docs uh, because you have uh, less context there. So, I mean, yeah, at the moment, I don't have uh, <laughs> a yeah. correct or, I don't know, proper answer to say, yeah, there is this very nice way which you can do with with, the, with small text but I mean uh, for what I can say is um, uh, for example I've been experimenting with neural networks for other uh, kind of topics um, and um, because yeah you know nowadays it's all about that um, and it's basically the I mean it's it's basically the same you uh, you need to have enough data to have something that really works in the end and it's still uh, an issue with open data. So we are approaching the end. We can still take one, maybe two more questions. Let's go back to the document. Yeah. Uh, slide deck. Yeah. Thanks. Um, just a very quick sh uh, follow-up question on that. Um, what's the corpora that you use for the for the ready-made language packs that you included? Ah, that's uh. a nice question. That's there is a wiki page. Deck, it's in the slide deck, right? Yeah, just go back. Yeah. Yeah. The the no. One. Yeah. The language packs. The first one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
I mean, but you, <laughs> you can find it here. <laughs> cool. Okay. So we have about uh, 64 language packs pre canned and uh, trained for different conversions English to English, Arabic to English, or whatever. So 64 of those combinations. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So one more, one last question. So you showed uh, languages that have a very similar structure, like Italian and German and English. Mm -hmm. Like, right. from the general principles, they are pretty similar. So how well does it work with, say, Chinese or African languages? Um, uh, if we have the language models for those languages, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's scroll down. No, no, there, there is um, Arabic. There is Russian. I've used them, the the um, Arabic one at work, uh, and. It, the, the the results were good enough, so <coughs> yeah, that's basically what I um, what I can do. I mean, there's uh, okay. Yeah. yeah, this was uh, previous, so this this page was uh, done incrementally. Okay. okay. So at some point, I uh, we put cool. a lot of them here. But yeah, yeah basically, the, the reason why I chose those uh, we chose those languages is because we can cope. I mean, yeah. we both can cope with, I can cope with India or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, cool. Well, thank you. Thank you for the talk. And let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.